people see as a grand new opportunity to stimulate our economy even as it makes possible ways of making decisions about our health in new ways. Uh, the discussion is entitled Personal Genome Computing, Breakthroughs, Risks, and Opportunities. And we have with us five distinguished speakers, Andres Pelionis, Linda Aby, David Medina, Carolee Nikolic, and Dietrich Stefan. Uh, they are among the most knowledgeable people in the world on this topic, and we're very fortunate to have them with us this evening. And our moderator is Phyllis Whiteley, and we'll get back to our speakers in a moment. But first, let me make a few brief announcements before the program begins. Uh, I would like to thank Gutenberg Communications for all of their help in helping us to bring this program to you tonight. Um, our thanks to uh, Suzanne Maddock and Kevin Fellin for their great energy and support. <laughs> and our next program will be on Wednesday, February 11, for our members only as we present leading technology visionary Bill Joy in his first major public appearance since 2006 when he spoke at the TED conference and it's happening at the Churchill Club. Um, after that, there is a breakfast on February 13, and when we're, we bring you Jerry Weissman, who is the uh, presentation guru who helped John Chambers and other industry leaders with their launches and IPOs, and he's going to talk about trends in that space as well as things that stand the test of time. And only a, a few seats are left for that event, and so if you have an interest, please be sure to sign up quickly. And finally, on February 24, join us for Starting Over, featuring some of Silicon Valley's most interesting and renowned uh, entrepreneurs who left their most recent companies and either started something on their own or joined another project. And they believe that economic downturns are a fine time to uh, start something new when entrepreneurs are between gigs, money is cheap, and everyone feels pressure to operate more efficiently. The Churchill Club is a not-for-profit membership organization, and so if you enjoy this evening's program and would like to consider membership, we'd be pleased to have you do so. You can always find information at churchillclub.org or by speaking to any of the Churchill Club staff and volunteers or volunteers this evening. So now on to our program. Um, our moderator, Phyllis Whiteley, has a deep interest in diagnostics and personalized medicine. As executive in residence at Moore David Al Ventures, she focuses on building companies in that space. Uh, she started her work in venture capital at 5AM Ventures, and she co-founded Anafor while there. And after earning her PhD in pharmacology, Phyllis held a diverse set of leadership positions in research development and business at companies such as Perligen Sciences, um, F. Hoffman LaRoche, and Merck. And she once lived in Switzerland and has done a lot of business internationally in Europe. She also built a subsidiary in Japan. And uh, she says that her German is mediocre, but uh, far surpasses her Japanese, since we'll, we're using English tonight. I don't think we have to worry about that. Uh, but clearly, the depth and breadth of her experience positions her extremely well to lead the discussion this evening. So please welcome Phyllis Whiteley. Well, thank you and welcome. This is a topic I know we're all very passionate about, so we'll try not to jump off as we're talking as we exude what we hope will be a really exciting um, evening. Um, of course, we're here today to talk about personal genome computing, breakthroughs, risks, and opportunities. And what we're leading up to tonight is to really ask, how is the home team going to do it? So what opportunities does Silicon Valley have to lead a genome-driven economy that exceeds other regions in the country? and the rest of the world. And I think it's a real opportunity for us to have this discussion. So I'm going to start with just sort of a brief introduction, at least from my historical perspective, and then we'll go on to the panel. So as I see it today, you know, on the horizon is the affordable genome. This really is coming, and it's really a breakthrough. We fully expect the knowledge and the insight from the genome to be transformative in ways yet to be imagined. Looking back over a short history as we think about it, you know, I just look at the last few decades. Post-World War II was really the time 
when we started to have breakthroughs in therapeutics. It was really the origins, the 40s, 50s, 60s, of the small molecule intervention. And of course, it's gone on to be very successful. Then I'll jump to the 80s. And along there, we started to have breakthroughs in understanding cells and understanding proteins. And that was really when we got a, a handle on the immune system and understanding uh, immune reactions. Biological therapeutics were introduced. As we start to think about the 90s, we moved to the unraveling of DNA and RNA. And the first tools became available. We started to use these tools so that we got to rapid cloning, RNA measurements, but it was very selective information. Towards the late 90s, genomics gave way to informatics. So we started the process of generating large amounts of data and had to build the tools to look at it. And by the early part of this decade, personalized genomics through the use of single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, provided the imminent affordability, and that gave us the access to the human genome. To give you a little perspective and try not to sound too old, in the 80s, I remember doing my PhD, and at that time, in about five years, you could get a degree if you cloned a part of a gene. Spent five years, cloned a part, that got you to a degree. Nowadays, high school students can do summer projects cloning sets of genes, sequencing proteins, and signal pathways. That's their summer internship. These are real breakthroughs. It's only a couple of decades where we have this capability. So where are we today? Today, we all want better medicine, better health care, wellness, prevention. We want to use this knowledge to impact our lifestyles. We want to know what we do, what happens to us, is tailored to our genome. Today, we already have many medicines which are given only to those patients with specific genetic markers. We can think of examples in cancer. We can think of examples in drug metabolism and cardiovascular disease. That's here today. On the horizon are newer diagnostic tests which can be used to predict and drive better management of disease. That sounds great. That's the tip of the iceberg. Today's wonders of information require tomorrow's ability to interpret, manage, and create action. Actions for physicians, actions for payers, actions for regulators, for legislators, for the reimbursement community, for patients, but for all consumers of the genetic information. Silicon Valley has been part of these breakthroughs. Look at our panel members, it's uniquely positioned to create the future. So today's topic is about the next generation needs and opportunities for obtaining, managing, handling, and interpreting the information of the genome. Genomics and computing are intimately linked to a better understanding of health, disease, medicine, and our environment. We can expect the information from the genome to become incorporated into the foundation of lifestyle applications from preferences to social interactions. This is transformative. Today, we have a panel of experts. The panel represents a cross-section of leaders in the field. And these are the leaders that are developing new business models and solving the problems of computing and utilizing the information. We're going to examine tonight the dynamic business and investment opportunities, as well as the risks, global competition, new individual contributor roles, and leading alliances that are emerging from Silicon Valley and beyond. To put it in perspective, Silicon Valley changed the world as the driving force in the development of computers and the internet. The key question for today, can Silicon Valley play a similar role in advancing a genome-based economy? So we're going to discuss a series of topics tonight. The topics will range from information technology, applications in medicine, providing direct access to information, investment opportunities, and partnerships. So I'll start with first uh, introducing the panelists. You've heard of them already. Um, you can read details on their bios, so I'm going to give a brief introduction on the Churchill Club website. Um, I could not do justice to their accomplishments, so I'll be very brief. So starting over here, we have Andres Pelionis. He's the founder of International Hologenomics Society, Hologen Tech, Helixometry Holding, if I said that right, formerly a NASA scientist and a research professor of NYU. Next to him is Dietrich Stefan. Dietrich is the founder of Navigenics, founder of Amnestics, and a former director of neurogenomics at Tijin. Next to Dietrich is Linda Avey. Linda is the co-founder of 23andMe and formerly of Affymetrics and Perlogen. Next to her is David Medina. He's the chief technologist in worldwide health and life sciences of TSG Hewlett Packard. And at the end is Carolee Nikolic. 
He's a U.S. partner of Davini Biotech Holding. He's the CEO of Amnestics and a former research director at Genentech. Wow. Um, our format today is we'll start with Andres and then we'll expand to our panel. Um, a little later in the program, we'll invite the audience to ask some questions. So I'm going to start with Andres and ask him to share his vision and set the landscape. And maybe we can start with Andres. You're talking about um, when you think about the reason for this event, what has changed in the landscape for Silicon Valley to bring us a new opportunity? Thank you, Phyllis. Well, I think we all know what happened in October. So this is time to quote Sir Winston Churchill. Uh, a pessimist sees a difficulty in every opportunity. An optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. So what can Silicon Valley be optimists about? Well, at least three things. Bioenergy, uh, a green economy, and of course, genome informatics. Especially now, when last year, genomics became informatics, uh, most particularly on July 14th, when Intel VC um, invested into Pacific Biosciences $100 million. So a new era started. And the, the vision is, the grand vision is, that I'd like to uh, uh, communicate with you, that uh, my vision is that if Silicon Valley grabs this unique opportunity lurking in our present difficulties, we can secure a leadership in a new era of genome-based economy that can renew prosperity for us and also for the Valley. Thank you. So Andres, <clears throat> what's new in the computation required for the next frontier um, as genomics and IT merge? Well, <clears throat> IT experts also know that uh, some other things happened. For instance, Moore's law, which was valid for decades, is no longer valid because you cannot speed up the traditional CPUs because after about three gig or so, it fries. So time has come to high performance computing and also to parallel computing and hybrid computers. Now in the valley, we have the leaders, we have the serial chip makers, the Intel, the AMD, the parallel chip makers, the Xilinx and Altera. And we have, we have at least three companies announced in Silicon Valley hybrid computers which are capable of uh, processing information, genomic information. One of them is HP, David probably will talk about it, and the other two is Xilinx uh, and also uh, uh, SGI. Thank you. So, so when thinking about this, what are the oncoming developments in genome computing? But for the oncoming developments, <clears throat> for hardware, as I mentioned, the, the genome computer hardware is already available. It's here. Very often, they co don't call them genome computer because the software is not ready. Now, software-wise, then again, there is a paradigm shift because the next generation software will have to be written in the chip, in the FPGA chip. FPGA stands for this uh, military developed uh, uh, parallel chips, which work together with the serial chips on the same motherboard. So you have the Intel or AMD uh, CPU, and then in a, in a socket, you have the FPGA parallel chip, and these hybrid computers are becoming available. Software-wise, we have a problem, because there is no software for these computers. So the challenge really is, and you, know, you can see from my bio, the challenge will be met, uh, writing software which will connect these high-performance computers, which we call personal genome computers, and can, we can address that information which is delivered to you on a stick uh, for a hundred or a couple of hundred dollars, and the question will be, where is the computer that you are sticking it into? <laughs> So I know we're going to talk a lot tonight about uh, personalized medicine, but in your view, how can the core of personalized medicine be expanded such that the genome-based personalization is used not only by patients, 
but by partners in prevention, customers, and consumers. Now, the PR firm Jankelovich, they stress that we should not talk about just patients. We should talk about consumers. Because personalization is not just for drugs, but it's also for other goods. Uh, and then the question really is, uh, how can we extend um, the, this genome information to the customer that the customer can make some use of it? So the grand vision here is that once you will have your personal genome, then you will have these hybrid computers, high-performance computers that you can stick it into, and then you can make personalized choices, not just for drugs in supermarket or off-the-shelf drugs or uh, food additives, but also for all kinds of goods. So this is this so-called uh, genome-driven or genome-based economy that we envision. And then lastly, how do the changes in genomics and the merging with IT bring us to the verge of a genome-based economy? I know that's a big question, but in your view. Let's uh, try to reduce it. Uh, the economy has always been genome-driven because uh, customers always bought what they wanted. But what customers like is driven by the genome, that are like this goods or, or that comes from the genome. So what's the difference? The difference is huge, because thus far we didn't know what our genome really wanted so that it's good for the genome. And therefore, sometimes we got sick, and then we realized that what we ate wasn't good enough. So by now, when genomics is integrated with epigenomics, and it becomes hologenomics, and we know that there is a recursion from DNA, RNA proteins, and back DNA, RNA protein. Then, um, of course, uh, uh, we can base an economy on these choices dictated by the genome in an intelligent fashion that we have the tools with our personal genome and the personal genome computer, and then, then we go shopping with a little PDA, and we can tell which food is better for <laughs> us, or for, like for Sergey Brin, who, you know, 23 and me found out that he has the SNP for Parkinson's. He has 20 years, and some very does, to prevent it. So he will be probably one of the first to have that kind of personal genome and the PDA to click whether food A or food B is better for his genome. Some uh, stuff rubs your genome the wrong way, but we don't know it yet for sure. But this science and technology will enable us for these personalized choices. Well, thank you very much. That's really helping us to set the stage and the landscape for our discussion this evening. What we'll do now is go on to our first topic and open it up to the panel. And uh, in this topic, we'll focus on the applications for high-performance computing and personalized healthcare. So the first question I have to the panel is, how does genome computing change healthcare and preventive medicine? And maybe I'll ask Dietrich if you'd like to start off. That's a hard question. You want a second one? Is this working? <laughs> okay. Um, well, I like to think about things in terms of problems and solutions. And I know that in Silicon Valley, that's the traditional formula for understanding whether something is fundable and sustainable. So what's the problem? All of us are going to get a chronic disease and probably succumb to it in our lifetimes. And there's uh, significant um, pain, stress, um, uh, and other issues surrounding that. On a, on a broader scale, um, the increasing number of people on the planet and the increasing shift in, in the demographics of those people to an aging population um, increases the prevalence of those diseases to a, to a, to a level where it's simply unsustainable um, in the next uh, 30 years. So for example, just in one disease like Alzheimer's disease, we have four to five million people alive today with that disease at a cost to the economy of about $500 billion a year. Uh, in 2050, it's anticipated that that number is going to be between 16 and, and 20 million uh, uh, people uh, at a cost to the economy approaching $2 trillion. So that's 40% that's that's of the GDP. It's simply unsustainable. Um, remember, today we pay 16% of our GDP to health care. Um, and it's going to break. So that's the problem. The, the solution is to decrease the amount of people that are sick on the back end of life. 
uh, so you drive those costs down. So with decreasing that window of morbidity on the back end of life is the goal. Um, and you're going to see that the emerging paradigm of uh, personalized preventive genomic medicine is aimed squarely at that. So take people early in life, sequence their genome, put in a computer, push a button, um, uh, and get a rank ordered list of what they're at risk for, uh, and then output through clinical decision support, again, via web services embedded in electronic medical records, uh, what a physician should do with their patient to mitigate those risks. So avoid smoking if you're at extra high risk for lung cancer. Uh, engage in early screening protocols, either blood biomarkers or imaging, uh, to catch disease at its earliest stages. Um, when a prescription is written, when you already have a disease, it'll be bounced off of your genome to say what dose and whether that person will have an adverse event to that particular drug. So um, there are multiple stages there where computing becomes important. One is just uh, getting this data off of these huge sequencing machines. So these machines produce terabytes of data and you need dedicated processors, programmable processors, just to do simple repetitive tasks over and over and over again. So you'll see companies like Mitrionics and others emerge in that space. Then you have to assemble all of this, billions of letters of sequence, and you'll see the cloud become critically important in doing that. And then in terms of um, the machine learning that sits on top of that, that says if you have this base in your genome and you were exposed to Fimerosol in a vaccine, and you grow up in this zip code, you're at extra high risk for autism. That, that machine learning, and, and Linda hopefully will talk about her elegant efforts towards this goal, uh, will sit on top of everyone's genome and medical records as an aggregate and learn where these pockets of, these combinatorial pockets of risk are. You can imagine the numbers of combinations that are required to crunch through that. If you have six billion letters in your genome and all the possible exposures and all the possible zip codes suddenly run into a parallel processing problem. And so um, immense opportunity for computing in this space. So thank you. So I guess um, maybe to others in the panel, if you have other points on that, what, what developments do you think would drive more possibilities? What is it we're looking forward to, to gain even more? Well, and it, this is the main reason why we started 23andMe is that we just saw a total lack of the data that we need to, to really generate the knowledge that will then lead to these, um, these decision points of a doctor finally having that information in their hands. And so it really is the development of all the, the technologies really that will be fundamental to making these discoveries. So that really is, we're right at the beginning of that stage. So it's great to think about the future where our doctor will have this information in their hands, but we're still a really long way away from that. And so for us, the, the big developments were the, the technologies developed by Affymetrix and Illumina where you're able to read the genome very quickly, very accurately, and then what do we do with that information? And so the next phase is to layer on all of this phenotypic information, all the environmental exposures people are having, and then do the machine learning to pull out what is, you know, what have you been exposed to? What, what did that produce? And how was that, imp how did your genome impact that as well? And it's a really complicated thing to get through to those endpoints that become decision making for physicians. And so we saw this big, big gap in what was going on in the research world versus what, mm -hmm. what consumers are really dying for, literally. And so that's really, um, I think all the pieces are there. That's the exciting thing now is we've got all this capability, and most of it's here in California, which is the most phenomenal thing. Mm -hmm. And we just need to leverage this and pull all these pieces together to create this body of knowledge that could inform the whole world, because not only are, do we have all this great technology, we have a very diverse population here. Right. And we can do studies in people who are from South Asia and China and all the different parts of the world that, that aren't being done right now. Mm -hmm. So that's really what we see is a, the real exciting opportunity here. So I think that that's very well put in terms of thinking of what gathering all that raw data and how to do it. How do you see what's required to go from raw data to utility? And again, I'll open this up to anyone who might like to. I, I, um, I guess from my view, I, I see some, some IT challenges on the back end when you start to think about the data. You know, I think of the world, we have those kind of challenges in IT where there's the hardware ch pieces that you can talk about, they're being attacked by, but the other ones are, are, are just how you deal with information. What is data? How do you turn data into actionable information? Um, the organization of data, and when you start to build models, and think about it in terms of you know, doing a database, right? If you're gonna do a simple database and you're thinking about functional dependencies, how do you model databases that you can really 
um, hit with different queries when the functional dependencies change all the time, when the data changes, when the relationships change, and when you don't know the data. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of challenges in that and being able to really aggregate that. So that's, this is a scientific one. I think that from the standpoint of a technologist in IT, that database technology, the, the, the crunching that, that is required from the standpoint of just pure compute power is very, very important, but there's a lot of thought processes, things like looking at ontologies, how you call things, what you call things. Um, there, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I think we are kind of at the beginning of that stage of trying to get that other information. Thank you. I would actually like to add uh, another angle, an important element here. You know, we've been talking about uh, deciphering the information. And I think, you know, you're really looking at the cutting edge, uh, you know, the people who are creating this, this new milieu, this new environment, the new knowledge. And I, I would like to point out that, you know, we will also need an enormous uh, amount of education behind this. We need to train a next generation of doctors who actually uh, grow up with this information, you know, on the tail of the information that, you know, you guys are creating. Because, um, you know, at this point we don't have those doctors yet. You know, at this point it's still a dream that, you know, I go to the doctor and the doctor will be able to interpret it. Uh, I, I've had my Navigenics uh, kind of panel of disease susceptibilities done, and it's a, it's a study, it's a 200-page study, you know, to try to understand that, you know, and I'm a scientist, I can sort of understand it. But I think, you know, this will require a next generation of doctors who will be educated by the leaders, who will be able to decipher this information. Yeah. And another angle will be for pharmaceutical companies. You know, pharmaceutical and biotech companies will also uh, come of age, I think, in adopting to all of this information. You know, there is a lot of effort going on in, you know, identifying mechanistic pathways, you know, identifying novel uh, targets for drug discovery, drug development. But then there will be also the angles that, again, you're at the cutting edge of identifying patient populations, uh, targeting certain mm -hmm. treatments to the right patient populations. And that will also require a lot of computation. Uh, the examples that the success stories that we have seen so far are, you know, the Herceptin and, you know, a few relatively simple examples. But I think, you know, companies like Genomic Health and mm -hmm. companies that are now looking more kind of co at more complex ensembles of genes and, you know, they are, they are again uh, moving, uh, pushing the envelope uh, to, towards kind of a deeper knowledge which requires a lot of computation. So I think, you know, these two elements I wanted to add, you know, the education and also the kind of the knowledge base, you know, creating yeah. the pharmaceutical biotechnology. So if we follow that train, um, I think we'd all probably say that personalized medicine has come. It's certainly growing, but it's come. So how, again to the panel, can you see personalized medicine promoting a personalized everything? How do we go from using it as personalized medicine to the genome-based economy? Well, as I tried to explain, um, uh, most people don't want to be patient because we don't want to get sick. So that is the, the large majority of the population who would like to prevent becoming sick. So that means that uh, Linda's, Trinity and me, company made this whole thing market driven because uh, it is customer driven business by those who are not patients and they don't even want to be patients and in fact they would like to age slower, most of them. So therefore, uh, for, for, a, for a very good start, now there is a market which is driving research and development so it's not a technology which is looking for a market, but a huge market looking for a technology. And this is what I think we see in this room and other elsewhere in Silicon Valley and in, in, in a global economy really like. And that is a, a major change business-wise. So we have a, the science change, uh, genomics becoming informatics, and then this big change that uh, instead of uh, government uh, uh, sponsored uh, R&D, that some people know, some people don't know about, it's becoming a market-driven economy. So one thing, Phyllis, we talked about, at, and we were just sort of dreaming at Affymetrics one day before I left about the idea that eventually, what if you could do a Google search and, in, and instead of the hitting the I feel lucky button, 
you could hit a button that said send my genotype out. And so say you did a search on vacations, you could send out that pertinent information tied to that information and, you'd, and it could be your risk taking genes or something and up would, up would pop up the perfect vacation for your genome. So that's, <laughs> that's the kind of thing where you're, you still have the choice as the consumer to say whether or not you want to use that information to, to bring information to yourself. But you know, we could see a day where, you know, because my vision is, is I don't ever want to see another ad for Viagra. Please, I'm a woman. I, you know, that's, just look at my X and Y chromosome. I don't have a Y chromosome. Just look at my, that simple information that could be fed to the media coming back at me. And that's really, I think we all live, we get this barrage of things that we don't even care about. And I want to be able to filter that in some way. And using the genome to filter that could be a really interesting way to look at it. That's terrific. Um, I think that's actually a very good segue into the next topic where we can talk about other business models and expansion of this. And in this topic, talk about providing access to and utility of personal genome information. So in fact, Linda, I'll stay with you and, and would say, uh, as a first question, what is the direct cons to consumer model that personalized medicine enables? Uh, or well, personalized health care? Well, it, you know, the, uh, like I said earlier, we, we're not there yet. We don't have the knowledge to really guide physicians on what, what we need to know. But, you know, the hope is, is that eventually once we have our genetic information, we've done enough studies, and that's really what we're embarking on now is this ability to, to query people in our database. You know, do you get a stomachache when you take an Advil? I mean, a really simple thing like that. We don't even know the genetic basis of that type of correlation. So if we can start to get that information, then that's when, you know, and what will pop up in your genome is going to be different. You know, Dietrich's going to have different things pop up than I do. And when you go into your physician, it's only going to be those pertinent bits of information that your doctor will have to pay attention to. He or she is not going to care about, you know, 99% of the data points that are yours that you really, really care about. But it's really more about what are those specific bits of information that, that should probably populate your EMR but then become informative um, as you go through your healthcare treatment. So that's really what we envision is that it's got to come from the consumer because individuals are going to care much more about all of their data. They're going to care about, you know, whether or not they have wet or dry earwax. Your doctor doesn't really care about that. But you might find that interesting. And so it's really taking the decision making and, and the, really the control of the information to the consumer and letting them decide, okay, this, this is the part that I think my doctor might be interested in. So in. In this area of specialty, we go to different doctors. We don't just go to one physician anymore either. So our cardiologist isn't going to care about information having to do with something with cancer or some other risks that we have. So it's, it's really all about tailoring the right information and then getting it into the right hands. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah, and as you all know, you know, this is now leading to uh, technologies that also require a lot of kind of IT support, uh, you know, a personal data card, uh, you know, this personal uh, health record management is already generating a new industry and there are multiple efforts in parallel running ahead in that direction, how this will be done, you know, who will control the information, how does the information get to the doctor's office if you have your full genome and that can be interpreted when you go to the doctor's visit, it's right there and the doctor already sees that report, you know, with your susceptibility genes, your drug sensitivity uh, profile and so on and so forth. So I think that, you know, this also is another genome-based economy, it, part of the genome-based economy that the manipulation and the control and the discretion, you know, how you handle this information is also, it also requires a tremendous infrastructure which is emerging. I, I think there's a point here too that can't be lost is that we're talking about kind of endpoints and there's still this other journey in between, between, uh, well, let's think 80% of clinical interactions take place in a primary physician's office. That's 10% have actual EMRs. There's not being driven. Um, once upon a time in my career, I sold electronic medical records into the, along with back office systems. Back office systems in a physician's office make money. They're there. Electronic medical records get in the way of the chart, and they cost money to maintain. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the things of the genome-based economy is going to be <coughs> things like 23andMe where, pa where patients, individual consumers, are going to have to take responsibility and drive that. Uh, is it a personal health record that is he held somewhere in the cloud that accesses your Navigenics or your 23andMe information? But there is still kind of this curve that has to happen 
uh, it goes back to Caroli's comment. You know, there's a generation of physicians that we have to edu that are being educated that are learning and accept these things. Um, and there's the basic economics, in, at least in the United States, of running a physician's office and being able to have an EMR and how you access it, and so these, so you can use these other plugs and use this other information. So, Dietrich. Yeah, I think there's also this interesting layer between this incredibly complicated information where you have billions of variables, literally billions of variables floating around in an individual that are somehow interacting to produce a totally unique risk for that individual. And I would say one of the challenges in going direct to consumer that we've learned is that consumers are just not educated or, or geared towards understanding risk. Um, and, and each individual person needs um, a counselor, a coach, a physician to, to sort of help them through it. I'll give you an example. Um, if I told you you were at twofold risk for Lou Gehrig's disease, which is a horrific disease which uh, uh, generally hits in the 50s, uh, generally people survive only a year thereafter and there's no effective therapeutics and they can become completely paralyzed. Um, you know, one person would say, wow, a 2% two, two uh, 2x two, two increase in, in a disease with, a, with an incidence of 1 in 100,000 is nothing. I'm totally fine. Another person, you know, may go off and jump up, off a bridge. And so there's, there's a whole layer there uh, that's ripe for, um, for uh, blowing out in terms of um, uh, uh, an economy and, and investment uh, surrounding risk communication, coaching, uh, interpretation, et cetera. And then, as, as we talked about, how do you layer that in to the physician who's also a layperson in this, in, this, in this area and how do they understand which biomarkers then to order in a focused way. So the, my vision is that instead of getting your 20 random labs every year at your annual physical, you know, you, you get 20 labs that are focused towards your hardwired predispositions. And how does the physician know which labs to order when and uh, in what combination. It's a very difficult job. So, so let's continue on this line and really explore how does this change the medical model and cost models? What really happens now in the future with this? Andres was... <clears throat> um, before that subject, okay. I'd like to expand on what uh, Carol said and also David said and also DT and Linda. We all say this, but, uh, we, and, and here we are. We are coming from different fields. You know, some of you are very well versed in, in technology, like Steve Kasselman, uh, the, the, the inventor, the, the father of reconfigurable computing. Uh, he knows FPGAs, chips. You now, some other people are genomists, and you know, they know the biochemistry of it very, very well. Some of you are doctors, medical doctors, who really know the medical aspects of it. So we have a very diverse community, and of course Silicon Valley is a very good place for this kind of diverse communities, and we have to do this education to bring them together. So we need meetings like this, probably on a frequent basis, and probably want to make these, these meetings even a global meeting, so that super experts come from India and from China and from all points of the, of the world. And that is an education process that we have to, have to do, and it's very difficult because you know, sometimes some doctors don't even like computers very much, but now they realize they have to live with them. And you know, it's, it's a challenge. So therefore, you know, from my bio, you can see that you know, there are ways how to bring it to the society. The other comment is that uh, um, you know, we need education, but also we need to give people tools so we still remember when computers were, you know, maybe a big computer, IBM computer sitting up there, but we didn't have it. And then it became, you know, every household, almost every household has it now. And then you don't have to be a super expert in computers these days, because it, it was made easy by Apple and other companies for you. So we have to bring down this very complex technological and, 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 uh, and uh, business model issues into the homes, to the individuals, and ultimately it shouldn't matter whether the person is medically oriented or technology oriented or, uh, or what are the cultural differences, what used to be the cultural differences among them. So if we think again about the cost of all this, we've raised a lot of things. We've talked about electronic records. We've talked about educating physicians. We've talked about a change in the treatment paradigm. Does the panel think that healthcare costs will go up in the genome-based economy or decrease? 
Well, if we can really move to a prevention model, we think the cost will drop dramatically. Because, and, and not only that, but people won't have to take drugs that, that don't work for them. We waste so much money on people taking drugs that, that just simply don't work. And it's, we call it the ketchup model. The Heinz doesn't care how much ketchup gets thrown away. It's the same, unfortunately, with the pharma. They don't care how much drugs don't work in people as long as they're selling the drugs. And we need to change that model. And it's going to come from consumers demanding better drugs that work for them personally. So it's all about getting this information out to consumers and to physicians who also feel the same way, we hope, that they would rather be in a preventive model. So we do think it, it'll take a while to get over the, the hump of getting more people informed, getting more genomes and databases that we can start tearing through to try to find these correlations. But once we get there, then there will be this huge return on investment where people are being treated before they get diseases. They're, we're doing preventive things. And when they do get sick, we have very targeted treatments. And another big problem is diagnosing disease is, is so 17th century almost that you know we still look at symptoms we don't look at the molecular level of almost anything yet so we could have eventually the ability to look at diseases and take them down to the sub level where we have top five different kinds of parkinsons it's not one kind and then that we understand that molecular basis for that type of Parkinson's, we'll know better what treatments are going to work for that because it could be completely different genes involved. Some people may have environmental exposures and their cytochrome P450 genes and, and enzymes aren't able to cope with those environmental exposures versus some people may get, they may just inherit the genes for Parkinson's. We don't know yet. So it's really about discovering those mechanisms and then using that information, which we do think will, will really lower costs. We just don't know when. Great. I, uh, a good friend of mine, the director of the Stanford Pain Center, likes to point out to me every time that, you know, I'm just chiming in with uh, Linda's comment how medieval, you know, some of the diagnosis is, that 92% of all doctors' visits uh, arise from some form of pain. And, you know, you feel pain, but it's an indicator of some underlying, uh, addition, uh, completely unrelated process. But I, I, I would also like to, to add to the, uh, to the healthcare costs. You know, my, my guess is, you know, we've seen it in the computer industry, we've seen it in the biotech industry, in the pharma industry. Costs, uh, once a process becomes uh, high throughput, once it becomes streamlined, costs drop tremendously. So I, I have a feeling, and in fact, you know, Art Levinson likes to point out in his, uh, in his occasionally when he talks about this, you know, the development of Herceptin cost about a tenth or so of what it would have cost without a diagnostic. So it was possible to actually reduce the cost and reduce the time of the development because they knew exactly what they were going after. And I think we will see more and more examples of this nature that, you know, we will have, you know, genetic, genomic information, we will target the treatment to the right population, and that will enable uh, a reduction of the, the development costs, and then it will be a faster development time, and then it will be used by a much lesser population, as Linda pointed out. Uh, you know, a lot of people take, the, take medis medicine today that's not, not targeted for them. Sorry. And uh, so I think that ultimately my, my gut feeling is that on the long run there will be a reduction, but you know, we will certainly go through a learning curve, and the learning curve will be expensive. And, and I think that part of this from an IT perspective too, there's some big challenges here that are going to sort of help to, to grow that. Uh, one of them is what we call the data deluge that is going on out there with just, uh, if you think about the next generation genomic sequencing, and sequencing your DNA. Um, a typical, uh, one of the sequencing companies now, a uh, one run is like three to five terabytes. It takes about eight runs. Um, each run is a week long, so you can run eight sequencers parallel. So you've got, what, 40 some odd terabytes of data that you just start with for one genomic sequence. Now, that's just the imaging, and then you go down the pipeline. I won't bore you with how, but it adds on. It's additive. Do you get to a point where you reduce it, where you sort of, throughout 80 to 100 gigabytes, where you say, well, Here's kind of where we think it, what, what we actually think your genome looks like, but we still have what's all this other data back here. So right now, where do you store that? Storage yeah, is kind of cheap for your back, but when you think about doing everybody in the United States, doing patients, doing a region, doing 100 people, there's not a lot of folks that have had their genome sequenced right now. So there is a learning curve, and that's going to, that's going to drive short-term costs, and, and again, you have to have 
in science and in IT science particularly, being able to start to drive some of those things down so storage makes sense, so you would have those in, the, in, in an accessible place, so you could get them in the cloud, or you could take them to your home, or you could put them on the stick. That's right. So I'm going to take advantage of being the moderator and throw out an alternative. So today we spend a lot of money on health care, but we have some of the worst health care in the world, certainly of the top nations. I'm not convinced our health care costs will drop, but I hope our health care improves. That's a Um, I, I think this has been um, very interesting. Would suggest that maybe we'll move on to um, another topic and move on to discussing information technology as David has just uh, led into because there are a lot of challenges in this space. And suggest that we start off talking about the challenges to high performance computing. You've started to allude to those as it serves personalized medicine and eventually this vision that we have of this full genome based economy. And maybe you can take us through what the challenges are going to look like. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. It's kind of, you know, IT is at the core of this, and it's, uh, I live in Houston. It's kind of like the plumbing in my house. It's up in the attic. You don't want to crawl up there, but I want to make sure that it does work. And, and so it's very, very crucial that you have this. Uh, and there's challenges, probably there's two different ones. I'll break down. One is in the hardware side. So there's, there's compute power, a lot of compute power that's required. And when you add more compute power, you want green, cleaner, lower power. Um, hybrid computers and a lot of those technologies start to address some of those issues, and those are challenges. Um, compute costs, where do you put data centers, where does that information go? Um, and then the other one is the one I just talked about is storage. Um, the sheer data deluge that comes out of this is, is, is just enormous, as I, as I, as I just, just mentioned. Um, and so those are some of the two huge big challenges that IT brings, but when you, you think about the hardware side, and then you get to the point to where now you've sequenced a genome, so what? So what? What does that mean? Um, and now we start talking about the IT challenges around data and data information. And if you think about what I would call the translational medicine model, which means that you take genomic data and it interacts with clinical data, and that's your doctor visits, lab visits, things of that sort. And then the other piece of this has to be socioeconomic. Where do you live? Do you live in a high pollution uh, area? How do these things interact? Um, now you go back and you revisit the compute power piece from a hardware standpoint. But there's just the simple IT challenge, and I think I alluded to this, about organizing that data. How is that data organized, and how is the information, and what relationships are you? I think there's a wonderful opportunity for scientists here in the, in the, next, in the coming years, um, wonderful opportunity for IT companies not just to develop hardware, but also develop database systems, and looking into new database technologies beyond the, the, the classic uh, uh, database that we think of, but rather in a technology such as semantic web and, and some other information-based technologies that allow you to, to really sort of organize and reorganize uh, data as it changes. Mm -hmm. Please. <clears throat> this is very interesting because when you talk about uh, uh, data deluge, uh, I talk about it on YouTube, you can look it up by my name, um, it uh, looks terrifically difficult. But we all know that there is a, a body of data, and sometimes it could be reduced to understanding. So this is where science has to come in, and it's coming in. When uh, in an earlier conversation with David, uh, we agreed that you know, once you can grab the tiger by the tail, and you can provide some algorithmic understanding, then the data suddenly looks simple, much simpler than they used to be. So I think uh, science will help, and it's, it's helping. And this is why I think in a software writing exercise, it's very important to be based on algorithms. And those new kinds of algorithms, which, which are based on some understanding of genome regulation. And then we can really look not just for SNPs, but we can also look beyond SNPs once we have these inexpensive genomes with the powerful hybrid computers based on the algorithm, we can pinpoint that here this regulatory structure has a problem, so then uh, we, we are much better off. Carolyn? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we, we all need to keep in mind, and talking about the science, that DNA is an informational molecule. It encodes information. It's the central storage of genetic information of our inheritance. 
And I think as of today, you know, we, we really only understand very little. We know we have around 25, 30,000 genes. We understand more or less, you know, that they have exons that actually got, get made into proteins. But we know very, very little about the introns. And the introns in our genome, in the human genome, add up to well over 90% of the sequence. And so the interpretation of this, and, and I like to, you know, many people have originally said that this is just junk DNA. This is just kind of sort of packing. This is, you know, spacing and so on and so forth. And I think, um, you know, what we have certainly learned is that there are regulatory elements, positive, negative regulatory elements, fine-tuning elements in that junk DNA that is coming of age. And I think, you know, Andras has started uh, a fantastic uh, analysis which is based on a, the pure mathematical treatment of this intronic DNA, and he has found some incredible associations with disease genes. So I don't know if you can elaborate on that a little well, bit. I'd love to. Um, I like junk DNA. That's my domain name, <laughs> junkdna.com. This is how you find it. Um, so it's, it's very good as a historical term. It's not true. This is this has to be has, has been a dogma which actually blocked progress of science, considering it junk. Yeah. You know, lately many people knew that it wasn't in fact foreign society to say so. Uh, but you know, if it's not junk, and um, Carolie told me in two thousand and one that you know look for the regulation because this is where it's at, so I did. And uh, you know one uh, dogma blocked our way, junk DNA dogma, and there was another one, which was called the central dogma of molecular biology. It said that from the DNA, RNA, protein, there is no recurse from the protein to the DNA. It, you know, a very famous person said so, Crick, from Watson and Crick. And uh, up to 2004, when he passed away, it, you, were, you were not supposed to say that, well, you know, the, the central dogma is no longer valid. But now we can say it. So I published a paper in uh, June 20th last year, 2008, saying that if you connect the dots from DNA, RNA, protein, and back to DNA, then we can continue. There is a recursion going on there. And that recursion actually is a fractal iterative recursion. And we all, we all know that things are not happening in a straight boom, boom, boom fashion. But you know, growth, growth is always like leaves by leaves by leaves in a tree. Or even for us, you know, it's a recursive process. So once we understand this fractal algorithm coming from a fractal DNA, then it's, it is much easier to deal with this beast because it becomes understanding rather than just knowledge. And you know, it will help a lot, I believe, and I strongly believe that, in um, carrying forward with this uh, fantastic business model of customer-driven uh, 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 genomic interrogation from SNPs to beyond SNPs to those regulatory structures, which are much more complex, but we are beginning to understand them. So th thanks. I, I hope the message everybody is taking away from this is that we need a lot of computational power. So the next question I'd ask is, what are the resources in Silicon Valley to derive the computational power that's needed? Mr. Hewlett-Packard. Is it just for me, or? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a, um, Well, I think computate front, well, so computa computational power, I, I would add storage, and, and I would also add kind of the IT smarts to understand how to put this data together. And I think those three go together. Uh, computational power will get you so far in, 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 in some of those things, but it, it still needs to be trained. So there's globally, and again, I don't live in Silicon Valley, I live in Houston. We've got a lot of computational power in Houston, probably more so here than we do in Houston, but uh, I think that aspect of it we're, we're dealing with pretty well. And it's not just power, but it's what kind of power. Is it clean? Um, uh, it, you know, we need to have a, a cleaner footprint, and data centers are very power hogs, and there's a lot of issues that deal with that. I think those are important to, to understand. Storage is the other piece, but um, the, the storage is, is, a, is, a, is an animal that we're, we're tackling with. And, and the question really is kind of not so much is there compute power, but is there enough storage to be able to maintain these until we get to the point in science to where we get down to that 80 gigabit that we talked about that says this is your gene. And, 
all the upstream stuff we just trust is real, and, and, and we get to that point. And we're a long way from that standpoint. Um, I'm not sure if there's enough storage anywhere right now to do that, but that's a big technological challenge and an opportunity uh, as well for organizations. Absolutely. I would also add um, databasing as a strength of this area, yeah. um, and an enormous strength. And it's fascinating that uh, search. So both of our companies were funded in the Series A by Google, for example. So what, you know, that, that's an interesting coincidence. And, and, it, and it's really because there's massive data sets that need queries sitting on top of them and search capabilities. And, and I see that as another enormous strength overlaid onto this space. Mm -hmm. And the other issues with database, I, I, because I think that's such an important key, is, is what is the data and the, the, the challenges of what you call things. You know, we have this, the concept of, is, when you look at all the different places where clinical data is, and you start to filter through in a hospital system, or, you know, is a breast cancer a breast cancer, or is an adenocarcinoma, is an adenocarcinoma of the breast, what are those things, and, and how, you, how are those stored, and what do you miss, and what do you catch, and those are, those, those, uh, that technology from the IT side of, understanding databases, how they're structured, and the, those ontologies, which is how things are called, what they're called, uh, the schemas, so that what we're calling is all the same thing is crucially important. And those are IT skills that, that come from here. Thank you. I think, um, you know, you know one, one more element of this is the visualization of the data. I think we, we haven't touched on that yet, but you know, this is also one of the strengths of, of Silicon Valley here. You know, we've, we've kind of given rise, Silicon Valley, I'm, not me, but you know, I'm speaking in this uh, royal plural, mm -hmm. that you know, we've given rise to the, 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 the visualization techniques that you know, Silicon Graphics and Pixar and you know, these kinds of companies are using. But I think for a doctor you know, to be able to interpret that data set you know, in a simple way and a transparent, understandable way, and also for a patient to be able to somehow see what exactly does all of this enormous complexity mean will require very clever kind of you know, display visualization mm -hmm. tools which, which are not quite there yet. I think right. they are coming. But, but they are still kind of early stage. So this leads into a good segue, and because we're running short on time, I'm going to move on to another topic. But Caraway, following up what you've been saying and the analogies, um, how is uh, genomics-based investment different today from 10 to 20 years ago? What's changing? Well, I think it's, it's fair to say that, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you know, the, the, the pioneer companies, you know, Insight, Millennium, and, you know, that first kind of generation of companies, Affymetrix was among them, um, certainly, you know, were, were driven by a lot of hope. And I was just last week at the JP Morgan conference, I met with Steve Holtzman, who was the master deal maker of Millennium. And he admits that not a single drug came out of all of those hundreds of millions of dollars that were invested in Millennium. Now, um, I think there was a, a, a tremendous degree of naivete, I think, at that point, uh, you know, that was put into genomics. Uh, not much came out, uh, very, very little. I think uh, what's happened is, and you know, we've uh, started a company together with Dietrich. In fact, he was the founder. I helped kind of on the business end. Um, I, I think we talked about what has changed. And, and in the 10 years, actually, what has changed is uh, multifold. There have been parallel developments perhaps on three or four fronts. One of them is you know, the enormous advance in, in computational power. And that's, that's you know, unquestionable. A tremendous uh, advance in the high throughput uh, genomics uh, analytical tools, you know, the Affymetrix, Illumina, ABI, you know, and similar kind of tools, Agilent, you know, they have advanced enormously. And I think we, uh, you know, data warehousing, you know, interpretation of the data. But one additional thing that we've recognized, and that's, that's also advanced now to a fantastic level, is high quality patient populations and volunteer populations. That, that really did not exist, you know, in the kind of conscientious, you know, very selective 
uh, manner that, that it's building up today and it exists. You know, some of the companies are indeed focused on this and have, have had very good success. I think one of the big success stories recently has been uh, one of the cardiovascular genes. I forget now exactly which one was it was, but you know it required 26,000 patients to be analyzed in a genome-wide association study, which then finally pinpointed you know what what was required, and that was a high-quality data set. Mm -hmm. So I think you know these elements have all come together. But you asked me specifically about the investment mentality. I think uh, you know 15 years ago, 10 years ago. So there was indeed a, a, a high degree of naivety and high expectations, rapid, rapid results. And basically the pharmaceutical industry became disenchanted with the results because they did not deliver. And, and I think what's coming now is much more focused, much more, uh, you know, much better designed experimentation, uh, better data sets, you know, higher power computing, higher power genomics applied to very careful volunteer and patients. You know, the, one of the success stories that came out, you know, that was the foundation of our company, Amnestics, was an analysis that Dietrich performed in looking at memory. Memory is a multigenic uh, trait in humans, and yet it was possible from about maybe between one and 2,000 patients to identify a very interesting gene that's responsible for short-term memory. You know, I think one of the uh, major changes I've seen in investing, and look for a comment on this, is that in the early part of this decade, there was a willingness to invest in um, databases in information for the sake of information. And um, those companies that just went to hunt for content. And I've seen a change in investors in focusing much more on how information is used in utility and a shying away even from technologies that might make databases or that might gather information. Is that, uh, are well, other people the saying that when you think of new businesses? And you, you have a better view into the, the venture world than I do, but I'm wondering if they're also shying away from companies who base a business model on patenting SNPs and pieces of the genome, because that's something else that we, we are going to be challenging, because we don't think that's the proper model. If you invent something new on top of a discovery, that's another thing altogether. But if you're just simply saying, I found this gene, there's SNP in this gene, and it looks like it's correlated to some disease. That used to be a model that probably would get funding, but I think anymore that's, that will be challenged to a point that that probably won't survive. Mm -hmm. I would also say that it's, it's interesting because as you watch the trajectory of the technology, um, for $100 in five years, you'll be able to sequence the entire genome and test for every single genetic condition in silico. Uh, and so a lot of the companies that started out being funded for single gene diagnostics, for example, or panels of genes, we're thinking about a company right now for, to sequence 20 genes in autism, for example. Is that a viable business model? Is that sustainable with the, with the IP um, potentially evaporating around it and the assays disappearing? Um, you know, that's a software model. Yeah, I, that's, that's exactly right. Andres? <clears throat> I, I think uh, certain categories will blur. Like healthcare is one uh, sector at this point, and a very expensive one. But consider that amount of money which is spent on video games by your teenager kids. It's a horrendous amount of money. And when you consider it from a, a computer viewpoint, you know, a, an Xbox is basically a, a small supercomputer because of the graphics. And we know that the, the, the genome computer the hybrid genome computer, and those video game computers that your kids already have. Now, they, they will actually blur into one instrument, and that will make it cheaper, because that is capable, that high-performance computer, which you will have in your home, um, will do many different tasks. So you know, this is why I love Linda's uh, 23 me model, because it's, it's not necessarily hunting for that kind of deadly disease which is going to kill you, but it's almost like an entertainment that now you, you really want. You are eager to learn about your genome. So are you playing or are you doing health care? Both. So and I think that, that, that is a, a fantastic model. Congratulations again. <laughs> because you know, that makes it ultimately cheaper. Now, how much money do we spend on, on, uh, on, on football? 
and soccer and uh, basketball and all of these sports a lot and, and entertainment. Mm -hmm. Entertainment industry is monstrous. So if you if we take away these you know, sector differences by very nicely designed tools which can be used in different things, at home very often you don't go to doctor but you go to Google mm -hmm. because you have some condition. And then what are you doing? Are you doing healthcare or Google searching? <laughs> So I'm, same thing. I'm, I'm going to bring it back to the home team, and uh, for our final question before the Q, before we go to Q and A, besides um, this wonderful place to live, why is Silicon Valley particularly well positioned to drive genome computing and to ignite the personalized genomics for all of our applications? Why Silicon Valley? I, I want to tell you just a brief anecdote. I, I, a couple of years ago, I attended one of these kind of brainstorming meetings. I think it was hosted by Ernst and & Young. And we had a futurist in the uh, audience who was kind of challenged, you know, what, what do you see kind of, you know, in the crystal ball. And it was fascinating to hear, you know, he, he said, you know, OK, I'll, I'll give you some kind of free association thoughts. And he said, you know, what if we will see um, uh, events in the future? Let's say, you know, Microsoft would acquire a pharma company or you know, Google would build a pharma company or acquire a pharma company because it makes sense. It will become an auxiliary and, and interjoint business. And, and it was a fascinating thought. And we had, you know, it triggered a lot of brainstorming and a lot of dialogue. But I think you know, Silicon Valley is host of tremendous computation. And I think we also have one of the pre preeminent deep, I mean, the role model biotech company, Genentech, here with over 10,000 employees. I think you know, Genentech has an unbelievable pipeline. So I think you know, the, the interaction between these would, be, would, would really lead to an explosion. I think you know, Silicon Valley is, is, is indeed, you know, it's wonderful to live here. But uh, I think it does offer uh, many of the elements. You know, 23 and me and Navigenics were born here. And, and that's already you know, a first kind of sign yeah. of the interface. Yeah. I think we're I think we're a land of risk takers here. I think we've been positively selected to be risk takers. That's why we're all here. I mean, that's you really think about it. I mean, the pioneers kept going west. Who came to the U.S.? People who took the risk. You know, your, your grandpa came, but his brother didn't come because I'm not going there. And I think that people continue to move west, and we we really are willing to take risks in this place. And I really think that lends itself to all of the companies that get started here. And you just kind of throw caution to the wind, and you say, why not? Let's try this. And I, I really think that's endemic in all the companies that are based here. And I think we really feed on that. And we all see it in each other. And it's, it's why this is such an exciting place to live. That's great. It's Dietrich, a, I know. Yeah, I would just expand on that um, and, uh, and say that you know, for the last three years, I've, I've seen more of Linda than I have of my, my son. And, yeah. we, <laughs> and, um, and we've been at every meeting together and, and literally, you know, wearing our bulletproof vests because this is truly disruptive to the established medical infrastructure. Truly disruptive. I mean, we're talking about preventive proactive medicine as opposed to reactive medicine and the whole financial model is going to be disrupted. Um, but, you know, we've done it. This is, this is, it's now accepted that this is what personalized medicine means. And um, that, that would not have gotten funded out of an East Coast VC house. There's just too much market risk involved in that. And so I would say not only are the building blocks here, but the risk-taking appetite from the investment community is, is, is spectacular. Terrific. Um, did we, should we go on to some Q&A from the audience now? Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike Calise, and I do have a vested interest in the answers here. Um, we talk about Silicon Valley and its um, greatness for computational capability and its greatness for taking risk in biotechnology. But often, uh, even folks here who make that transition between the two um, are a uh, small percentage of the population. And one of the risks we could see is that, you know, 
The biologists say, oh, I'm a biologist when you talk about technology. And, you know, when the biologists start to talk, I'm a technologist. So what do you guys see as the risks associated with uh, melding the two uh, separate schools of thought into, into being a successful uh, uh, pr promotion of this vision? Well, I can say what we've found at, at 23andMe is that we, you know, most of our engineering team is from eBay and PayPal, and they're from the tech side. They come in with a completely fresh perspective, which actually is wonderful because <laughs> they don't look, they haven't been trained to think about this molecule in a certain way. They just see it as data, and they're like, why would you store it that way? I mean, we, coming from Perligen, we thought we had a really great model for data storage, and, and we won awards for bioinformatics, and, and then when I got to, you know, when we started 23andMe, the, the guys there were like, why, why would you do it that way? They kind of heard the model that had been created, and they were just like, that's crazy. So I think, if anything, it's the cross-melding of ideas that really is where we, we benefit, and if anything, I, you know, I see that as a huge positive. I would also add that that's also the biggest difficulty in bringing these, I mean, we, our, our specific is a total hybrid. And you have engineers talking to genetic counselors, talking to, you know, physicians, and they don't speak the same language at all. <laughs> and so there's a lot of bumping around in there. Mm -hmm. And again, I would like to add actually my, you know, previous comment, the educational element. You know, I've, I've been on the faculty at Stanford, and I think it's fair to say, you know, we have this BioX initiative. BioX is exactly designed for this cross-fertilization between technology and biology and medicine. And I think we will see an emergence that are already people who are uh, graduating from this BioX program who, who are, and we have a biodesign program also, who are going to be much more knowledgeable, who will be geared towards this kind of merger. Yeah. Between and, I, and I would take it further because we see with customers all the time that, you know, with biologists, uh, IT is just a portion. Uh, uh, bioinformatics is embedded more and more in the academic centers. They're growing up with us. It's a part of what they do. If you're publishing papers now, you're not publishing papers unless you're involved with some of these bioinformatics pieces, which means that you're intimately involved with the compute on uh, computing capabilities, the database management, all of those types of issues are a part of your tool set in, in addition to the wet lab work that you do. At, at HP, I run an industry architecture team, and one of my architects is a PhD molecular biologist. Mm -hmm. Understood you. <clears throat> Back to Churchill. Um, again, as, as Mike said, there is, a, there is a challenge here, particularly now, since October, because we can see, probably you would agree, Carole, uh, for my investment, and Phyllis also, that there is really a, a, a massive pullback. Companies are doing, you know, let's put our households in order, let's res preserve the capital. So they are, they are focusing to pure play that is a that is a difficulty because you know uh, these entities which almost reached uh, overlapped they are pulling back here comes the opportunity create a company which fills them so uh, that's what i'm doing so uh, again you can see this as a big problem that companies are going back to, to pure play chip companies want to do only chips i like genomics but you know i can't afford it at this point maybe when we are over this this problem, so uh, it's it's not a very easy going, but there are opportunities here. On the side of enthusiasm about Silicon Valley, I can, came very far from, from to get here, and I love it. But um, we shouldn't take it granted that this it couldn't happen to a nicer bunch of people than us. <laughs> but we, we can't we can't take it for granted that by necessity, by default, it will. Because, for instance, this notion that uh, Linda touched upon this, you know, that if somebody learns that oh, I have uh, the SNP for, for uh, Gulick disease and, uh, and commit suicide, you know, uh, we have to change the mentality. And the, we have to make sure that uh, 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 hereditary diseases are not considered uh, incurable. This is how the Broad Institute was actually founded by Mr. and Mrs. Broad, every, every, everyday folks except a bit better and odd. And because of the, the construction business, they have plenty of money. Uh, there was a Crohn's disease in the family. And then they were told that it's hereditary and it's incurable. 
they accepted the notion that it's hereditary, but they said, what do you mean in, in, in Korea War? How much money do you need? And then they established Broad Institute at $100 million. Next year, a second $100 million. Now they are up to $600 million from one family. So I th wouldn't take it for granted that like Houston, if some very rich person on the, on the petrol business, when he gets a little bit older than he used to be, or he, she, and then, and then they say that we have, we have more money than we ever dreamed of, but this disease is not theoretically, since because of the recursion, it's possibly that it's, it can be cured. Now how much money do we need? So this kind of venture of philanthropy may pop up in Houston, <laughs> so or it may it already popped up in Boston. Good. So if we don't, don't grab this ball right now, as we speak, then it might not happen to Silicon Valley. Well, Andres, I'm just cognizant. I'm in Silicon Valley and not in Houston, so I sort of, you know. <laughs> so thank you. I, I'm going to make sure that we get a few more questions in from our audience. Uh, Steve Schlenker, uh, DN Capital. I really appreciate the panel's very interesting discussion. Uh, quick question on the business model. Uh, I guess, Linda and Dietrich, you were talking about defining relationships which encompass what's on the gene, what's in the environment, uh, behaviors. But when I listen to what uh, David was saying, it sounds like a classic double uncertainty problem where you don't know what schema you need to define because you don't know the relationships, and the relationships themselves change over time. So that doesn't lend itself to a relational database. Why not just create a model that says, we'll throw all the data out there and create an engine so that people can look at it on the fly and be able to define at that moment in time what is that relationship, rather than trying to predefine relationships that people search off of? Yeah, and actually that's, you know, that is kind of the model. So we're, you know, we see this as a very dynamic data set that is constantly being analyzed and constantly being looked at in a number of different ways and from all these different perspectives and angles. And the more information we gather and keep gathering and piling on top of the genetic information, hopefully the more of these correlations we're going to be able to make. And it's pretty straightforward. Doing genome-wide association studies is pretty well thought out and pretty well established now. And so that, but it's, it's really more about how do you collect more and more information including the environmental things. We don't know how genes in interact with environment really at all, and that is something that changes on a constant basis. So it's really, this is where you can use the web and using mobile devices, and people are collecting information all the time about themselves, and now let's start. The, the good thing about looking at SNPs, and the reason we started with SNPs is because we can measure them very accurately and they stay stable in a person, so that is at least a place to start where you can then look at, you know, this changing information stacking up on top of a, a pretty static genome and see what, what's impacting it, what's, what's happening on a, you know, on a monthly, yearly basis. I'd just like to add to that. I think there's, there's a unique issue with respect to medical information. Um, there's evidence-based medicine, which means you've discovered something, you've shown it to be real in a replication cohort, you've shown that if you tweak it, you have improved clinical outcomes. Um, and then it goes to the FDA, and they look at it for a year and bless it. And, and, then, it, and, then, it, and then it has to be in practice, and then it goes in the guidelines. It's a huge, long process for just one correlation. Now you're talking about huge data sets with magical algorithms running on them where, where a person or a physician pops in with their information, pushes a button, and in real time it sort of recomputes risk based on newer and newer information. Um, so that, there's that tension between evidence-based medicine and personalized risk assessment the latter of which is a, is a call that's never been seen before. It's not a bucket that's ever been seen before. Every one of us is unique. And, and there's where the tension is with respect to medicine and the regulatory agencies, and, and that's going to have to be overcome. And so I don't know if that's a, an answer to your question, but it's a, it's a comment uh, uh, on it. Good. So I think we'll take another question again. I'll ask, we'll try to be a little brief in the answers so we can get a number of questions in. Hi, my name is Ben Deloach. Um, what do you think the impact will be on the life insurance industry? <laughs> Any thoughts? It's a, you know, it's, a, it's an unanswered question right now of how genomics and, and any kind of risk profiling will be used in health, but, or in, in life insurance, and it, it's, you know, right now, like, I, ha I can't get life insurance because I had um, WPW, which I had surgery for, I had it fixed. 
So it, it's the insurance company still won't give me life insurance for that. So, you know, it's already a problem, and they could already look at your family history and see that and say, okay, your your father had Alzheimer's. Does that mean the insurance company isn't going to give you, in, you know, life insurance? So the, it's it's not just a genetics question. It's more about how do the insurance companies use this information, and and how can we all as a society come together. And, and have it used in a more positive way. And so, you know, we see GINA being passed as one, the first pass of the, the government stepping in to say, genetic information has so much utility and there's so much positive utility that can come out of it. We need to protect people and make sure that both companies and health insurance, um, or your employer and health insurance companies don't discriminate against you. That has a long way to go. So I don't think we have the right um, framework yet for the laws to protect us, but it's, I think it's a broader question than just looking at genetic information. And I'm going to interject on this also because it is an area that's very actively being discussed and a lot of activity going on in legislation. And in the end, insurance has to have a, a good business model as well. When you think of the health care insurance, the real problem is they don't insure you for your life. You cycle through different health care insurers. So it's hard to come up with a business model that makes sense for them to invest in your well-being and in your preventive health care. I think we have the same issues with other forms of insurance, and the challenge is finding a business model that makes sense for insurers and that benefits you know, all of us. Yeah, hi, Robert Dickinson. Um, the majority of chronic diseases, at least in this country, are the result of poor behavior choices by the people who have those diseases. And, it, it, and I, re I realize there's often biomarkers for these things, but uh, there's also a lot of very cheap, old ways of diagnosing and treating and, and preventing these diseases that have been around for a long time. And I'm wondering how this panel um, uh, uh, sees the, the capabilities that they envision, um, how they might address the behavioral issue um, and, 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 as a, and overcome that um, as they implement these technologies. Who wants to change their behavior? I can try. I mean, we, we see something very unique with respect to encouraging behavior change uh, after someone getting their genetic information. I'm not sure what, I don't think we understand what it is about the G word that makes people change their behavior and have sustained behavior change over the three month attrition hump, uh, but it's real. And we've looked at this in, in hundreds of people now. and. Um, over 50% of people maintain behavior change if they're at risk genetically. Maybe it's because it's personal, maybe because genetics has a stigma or a, a fatalistic aspect to it. Um, but then if you arm them with uh, actionable information, that they, they actually do engage in it. So I don't know the answer. Did we have a, another question? Question here. I um, wonder if you could address clinical drug trials for drug testing and the vast numbers that we really need to prove efficacy for some Carolyn? Things. Yeah, I think this is coming of age. Uh, this is ongoing. You know, uh, some of the pioneering companies are conducting trials with uh, certain uh, monitoring. It's not there yet. The FDA has established a panel that is studying the issue. Um, I think we will see much more. I think, you know, you may also branch out into this business. There are some success stories that have been uh, published where you can distinguish between responders and non-responders based on genomic information. So I think that, again, this is a very, very important uh, element of this genome-based uh, economy that pharmaceutical companies will have much more effective trials, uh, better targeted drugs. And we are beginning to see some of the first success stories in that direction. Other questions? Yeah. Back to the Xbox, thanks. My name's Clive Bolton. Uh, so the question is, uh, reasonably, how long is it really before uh, we'll be able to get hold of the data uh, to, to make a game that, uh, for example, the Uni University of Washington has a protein unfolding game where you can go on online to their cloud app and you can actually try to unfold the protein. Um, how, how long before I can get a hold of the data? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think uh, uh, we can uh, safely uh, say that uh, two companies in the Valley, of course, uh, Complete Genomics in Sunnyvale and also Pacific Biosciences in uh, uh, Menlo Park, they announced, not me, that uh, complete uh, uh, sequencing is coming within about uh, uh, six months from Complete Genomics. 
with a, a bit larger price tag, about $5,000. And then uh, in, within um, uh, uh, 19 months, it was three months ago, so it's, it's, uh, it's 16 months from now, uh, uh, Bio will be ready, a couple of hundred dollars. So um, I think the big difference is just like with the internet boom, once the government let go and let the private industry do it, you know, customer uh, driven, uh, market driven, everything will be happening much faster than we think. The internet developed from emailing, you know, as a military uh, 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 infrastructure, and it catapulted with the browser. And it happened much faster than, than we anticipated. Now, this kind of genome-based economy with the, with the genome computer, when I outlined for a VC, now, his, he thought, he said, it's probably going to happen in five years. Or do I outline it for 10? Mm -hmm. So it will not be longer than maybe two years. And this is now when we are, where this whole thing will be two years from now, <laughs> five years from now, 10 You're years from now. You're doing your final question now. I think, I think uh, within two years, you will see some of the first games. Great. <laughs> I think we have time for two more questions. Are there? Katie Korsmar with the Bay Area Biotech Education Consortium. I think everyone on the panel has alluded to education, and I want to thank the Churchill Club for letting some of the educators come as guests tonight. We're learning quite a bit. Um, so besides education in the positive sense, as you mentioned, students doing sequencing now in the classroom, which is what our nonprofit supports, you also mentioned the ignorance out there for the public or the lack thereof of education in, in following advancements in this field. How do you suggest that we can support educators who are working in silos in schools where biology, chemistry, and physics, and technology don't even mix? And yet we're trying to produce this next pipeline and also a science literate citizenry. Well, I think you can, I spent some time thinking about this in Arizona, which as you know has the 49th um, best educational system in the country. And, um, Ever the optimist. <laughs> and um, it, it, I think it falls into buckets. I mean, one is uh, students and, and giving them summer internship opportunities and really letting them um, explore. And, and they take to this stuff naturally, just like you can take a kid and put them in front of a computer. You can put them in front of a $2 million sequencer, and they get it. and they. They just turn it on and it goes. So that, that's important. Um, and I think there are, are immense opportunities across the valley for that. The, sec the second piece is teacher education, both through summer internship programs as well as um, um, uh, web-based educational materials as well as uh, sending speakers into the, into the, into the, into the um, schools to assist with teachers. Um, those are the two things we found most effective. I think there has to be a personal touch aspect to it. I don't think a pure web delivery of content mm -hmm. is appropriate in this setting. Carolyn? Yeah. I'll, I'll add two thoughts to it. You know, one is Phyllis pointed out that, you know, 20 years ago it took five years to clone part of a gene, and today a summer intern or a, a summer high school student will clone several genes with the kits available. So I'm sure that this is coming. I, I'm sure that along with the cutting edge work that's done by, by the leading companies, I'm sure that the kind of information will, will be spread around and it will follow. But I think um, uh, uh, I, I would also like to kind of say that um, there is a very good website, and I don't know if you're familiar with Access Excellence. Uh, if you're familiar with that, I think you know it's good to be in that kind of network. I think this was pioneered by Genentech originally, and Genentech has hosted high school teachers who have come in. So I think, you know, perhaps uh, this is something that you know the cutting edge companies can participate in. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Access Excellence. It's a program to foster high school and even elementary school education. Uh, by hosting teachers at your companies. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a fantastic program that could really, you know, lead to the evolution of the next generation. 
Yeah. But I do think a grassroots approach works often. And we had a we actually had an AP biology teacher from Los Gatos come in over the summer to work on materials that he can then put out on the listserv. And he even thought through, you know, where in the AP bio curriculum does this fit? The last month, they already take their test, they've got the month at the end of the year. And one of the things we stress is that it's, and one of our board members um, talks about statistics. You know, if you talk about dry statistics, it's really boring. Nobody really wants to hear about it. But the minute you get a baseball fan talking about the stats of their favorite players, you forget that you're talking about statistics. It's the application of the use of those, those tools for looking at numbers. And it's the same thing with your genome. If, if you're looking at a dry tech genetics textbook, everybody's going to fall asleep. But the minute you're looking at your own genome, everything changes. And it becomes very personal, and you have a, a real vested interest in it. So that was what he got excited about, is if, if there's any way, and, and luckily in Los Gatos, there's a lot of kids who, 399 is nothing. I mean, they buy all these games and everything. If they can, you know, if their parents will consent to have them get their own data, that's a really great educational tool. And, and there are other things that we can do for those kids, you know, that aren't, aren't as fortunate. And we've, we've really been trying to build a lot of these tools for the, at least starting at the high school level. Great. I think we're probably coming up to the end of our time. So I'm going to ask a final question and ask our panelists who've given us a lot of information, a lot of food for thought, to summarize and to tell us um, the timeline. What does a genome-based economy look like two years, five years, and 10 years down? What, what's your vision? Um, and so we'll go ahead. And I, I know uh, time is running short, and I know this is a 30-minute topic for each person, but we'll try to keep it to 30 seconds or so. Let Andre start. <clears throat> In two years, we'll see the first games uh, run, running on Xbox-type uh, uh, heavy-duty, uh, high-performance computers that your kids already have, but also you will have it. In five years, now it will be very common that there will be two different shoppers, one who didn't do this genome test and doesn't have the genome, and the other guys and girls, they will just click on this and this vitamin or food or whatever, and they will, they will save money. Because how many of you know whether you are taking too much or not too much vitamins? You have basically not enough information about it. Within 10 years, we will remember today, and we will look up, fortunately, on, on YouTube, that now, 10 years ago, we in a very difficult or, or time, and it was full of opportunities. Now, we started this. And then we would not really imagine how did we do it before. Just like, <laughs> how did we live without internet? <laughs> very uh, difficult. Yeah. Inconceivable. Um, I would say in the 10-year time frame, we're going to see real practical implementation of personalized genomic medicine um, in a clinical setting. I think we're also across that time period. I, my, my, the picture in my head is of bubble wrap. You see all these little mini bubbles that are constantly being popped and emerging again. And I think that's because there's a lot of sensitivities around this information. There's going to be a lot of litigation. There's going to be a lot of misuse. There are going to be a lot of ethical dilemmas. There are going to be industries that emerge and then are squashed by regulation. And I think it's going to be a fascinating landscape over the next 10 years. Thanks. Linda? Well, I think, and same thing, I, you know, two years I think is pretty, I'm more of a realist. I don't think we're going to see a lot of change in how we live on a daily basis based on our genetics. But five years I think we'll start to see drugs, more and more drugs on the market that are targeted to our genomes. And, I hope in 10 years, you know, I, I have a 21-year-old son. He may be old enough to have a child, and I hope my grandchild is genotyped or sequenced from day one, and we all know as a family what that child will be up against and that we'll all be there to, to have him or her live the health, healthiest life possible. Thank you. David. I, I, uh, I think over the 10-year period, I think that uh, we have a couple of different things. I don't see two five. I see some concurrent things. I think first there's an infrastructure of physicians and individuals so that electronic medical records and the capability of actually transmitting this information to people who are going to use it, both as a professional as well at home, is going to build up. I think in five years we'll certainly see some of the next generation of genomically based drugs. And in, and in 10 years, um, if I could tell you what's going to happen 10 years from now, um, I would be a, I'd be a very rich man in 10 years, but uh, so um, if I could tell 10 years ago. But, but I think those are kind of trends that uh, we, we still have some work to do on infrastructure. And um, the biggest infrastructure is that electronic medical record and health record, making sure there's access, ubiquitous access. Great. Thank you. Carolee. 
I, I actually would support the idea that in about 10 years, I think the, the cycle of drug discovery and development and the regulatory approval and, and you know, the, the, the timelines are relatively long. So I, I would agree that, you know, it's, it will take about 10 years when we will see real kind of therapeutics that are based on this kind of genomics-based knowledge. But I, I would agree that in about five years or so, we should say, we should begin to see this kind of, you know, prevention mentality, the, the genome-based uh, lifestyle adjustment. You know, indeed, uh, I, I agree what uh, Dietrich previously said that, you know, I, I, I've heard stories and I know a couple of the people who indeed took that uh, genomic information more seriously. It's a solid piece of information. You know, it's something that you can't change, right? You know, you're, you're shown your, you know, your mirror. It, this is you. And, and, you know, if you see that, okay, these are these susceptibility genes, you know, you, you, and you can do something about them you know, you will begin to, you know, somewhere it sinks in, you know, it, uh, your self-appreciation kicks in. And I think, you know, five years will, will indeed, the technologies will evolve, the tools will evolve. And uh, I, I would just add a final thing, you know, that this is indeed an incredible time, despite the fact that, you know, October happened last year. Um, again, at a recent meeting, I heard that the Chinese character for risk is composed of two elements. One is danger, the other is opportunity. So it's a combination of danger and opportunity, which is risk, and we are risk takers. Wonderful. So with that, I'd like to wrap up, um, thank the organizers, the Churchill Club, the audience, and this extraordinary panel for a thoughtful and visionary discussion. Thank you. I want to echo that. Thank you to all of our speakers. And as a small gesture of our appreciation, we hope that you and your genome will enjoy wearing these Churchill Club t-shirt and t-shirts and that you will wear them in good health. Thank you all for coming and hope to see you on February 11th for Bill Joy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, that's quite all right.